Hey YouTube, it's Millie. I am kind of back from surgery. If you didn't see my community post, I posted about a week ago that I had was going to be having surgery and it's been exactly seven days since my surgery. I am feeling really good. So I wanted to film a video about this new vintage bag that I got. And basically what I'm gonna do during this video is just start the restoration process with some leather CPR on this bag. There's a couple other things that I plan to do to it, but I first want to just get it hydrated. It looks pretty good already, as you can see, but the leather does feel pretty dry. So I want to at least get a coat of leather CPR on there. And then while I'm doing that, I figured I could talk to you guys a little bit about how recovery is going. I have never filmed myself conditioning a bag, so I don't know how this is gonna work in terms of like me working over the camera here, but we will see. I actually do like to start at the bottom and kind of work my way out. And on here you can see there's like a little bit of scuff marks on the bottom of this, but nothing too bad. I was really surprised at how good this bag came. Like the inside of this is so clean. And I ordered this on Mercari. I, th I think that's how you say that, on Mercari. But I have gotten some pretty dirty bags <laughs> from there, so I really didn't know what to expect because this was a pretty good deal that I got this for. So if you are not familiar with conditioning bags, there are so many different products that you can use, and I am by no means an expert. I follow a lot of other people online who have taught me just basic skills and leather CPR, which you saw me put on this bag, that tends to be my favorite conditioner to use. But I do also have Cham Chamberlain's Leather Milk. Um, I have the Coach Conditioner or Moisturizer, whatever you want to call it. And then I have some cleaning tools, which we might talk about at the end here. but you really just want to work this in. You'll see what I will do at the end, but right now we're really just trying to get this worked into the leather. And you want to be really careful on the creases here. You can use like a cotton t-shirt. <clears throat> a cotton t-shirt or, or a horsehair brush to buff everything out and make sure you're not leaving any like chunks of conditioner on the bag to dry. You really want it to be like <clears throat> soaking into the bag. Clearly I have not talked a lot in a while because my voice is very raspy here. Okay, so after we do the bottom, I'm gonna work the sides a little bit. And actually, when I first started, oh, uh -oh, see, that's what I was afraid of. Um, when I first started learning how to do this and like really like what you're supposed to do, this is probably going to make some people cringe, but I did not realize that you want to work this in with your hands. So I used to put this on bags and use a cotton t-shirt to rub it in. And I never understood why it didn't seem like it was working. And this is why, because you need to like really rub it in with your hands and you want the leather to be absorbing whatever you're putting on it. So you can kind of see right here. What I tend to do, I go back with the horsehair brush and just get any excess out of these creases at the end, but you can do that as you go as well. Kind of use your finger. So I did say that I would talk a little bit about how recovery is going and 
I'm day seven and I'm standing up as I'm filming this and holding something in my hands as I'm filming this. So let's hope I don't regret this. <laughs> I don't think I will. It seems like walking has maybe been like the hardest thing for me so far. But for those who did not read my community post, I ended up having to have a total hysterectomy and that's a very specific term. So a total hysterectomy is when you have your uterus, cervix, and fallopian tubes removed. A radical hysterectomy is when you have everything removed. So that would mean your ovaries as well. I was able to keep both of my ovaries, but I did end up having to have my uterus, cervix, and fallopian tubes removed. And the reason for that, so we knew this was a possibility that I may have to have this done at some point. I'm in my mid-30s right now, and I have been having issues since my mid-20s with OB stuff, GYN stuff. Um... So my husband and I had been talking about it because we are people who we don't have kids for context and we have never been sure if we wanted to have kids or not. We know lots of people like friends of ours, family members who have always been very set on wanting to have kids. And that just was never us like from the from the time that we started dating and we've been together for over a decade, I think 12 years now, 2011. Okay, going on 13 years. Um, we've both just kind of been very ambivalent about it. It's never been something we felt very strongly about. So when these discussions started happening that we, you know, may have to consider surgery for me because of all the issues I was having, it wasn't a super emotional thing for us like it was for other people that were hearing about us having to go through this. But um, for us, we just never, it wasn't like we have to be able to have kids. This was going to like devastate us. But what ended up happening <clears throat> is that I had an ultrasound to check on all of the issues that I've been dealing with for all of these years Things seem to be getting worse, but generally what they do is they'll have me do an ultrasound to see if they can see anything. There's been times in the past where I've done ultrasounds and they have found things, but it wasn't that serious. Like we were able to uh, just have like non-invasive ways to manage whatever they found. But this time, unfortunately, what they found was pretty concerning. I had already met the surgeon that we had considered using if we had to go the surgery route. She is amazing. For those who are in the Ohio area or use the Cleveland Clinic, her name is Dr. Kara King. And she is an endometriosis and pelvic pain specialist, and she travels the country actually talking about how to do non-invasive or minimally invasive surgeries for people with these issues. So I knew she would be the person that I would want to do the surgery if I had to. So everything kind of ended up escalating based on what they found on this ultrasound finding. Originally, the surgery had been scheduled for May of this year. So we thought we were going to have a lot of time to prepare for it. I work for myself and I have my own clients as a therapist, so that would give me time to kind of like prep with them too. But um, I was in a lot of pain. And that's what's kind of crazy is I'm like standing here filming this video seven days after major abdominal surgery. I'm in less pain than I was before. So that's wonderful, but because I was in so much pain, the surgeon's office said, you know, we're going to contact you if anything opens sooner than May. They ended up calling me and were like, hey, we can get you in next week. Can you do this? So that was pretty chaotic. Um, 
I have about 30 clients that I see regularly through my private practice. So I had to contact all of them. All of them were like, do what you need to do. We're going to be okay. So was able to figure out a plan with all of my clients, was able to figure out a plan with my husband. He actually was supposed to be going on a uh, backpacking trip. He does that with a couple of his friends pretty regularly. And he ended up canceling that trip because he wanted me to get in as soon as possible, given what was going on. So he canceled that trip, which ended up working out because the guys ended up not being able to finish the trip for various reasons. So he didn't really miss out on anything, which made me feel better. So base, I mean, that's basically what happened. Everything got rushed up. Um, the surgeon's office was super helpful in like making sure that I got everything I needed to do done so I could have the surgery because there's a lot of like pre-up appointments that you have to do so they got all of that set up for me um and yeah I mean I guess that's pretty much it um the surgery even though it's minimally invasive is no joke so what I mean by minimally invasive is I was not completely opened up like you would see people are opened up during like a c-section you actually only have three incisions. Okay, technically four. So I have four incisions, one through my belly button, and then like a diamond shape around my belly button. And those incision marks are only half an inch big. And basically they do the entire surgery through those tiny incision marks. And then the belly button is where they put a camera to be able to see what they're doing during the procedure. And I won't go into all the specifics unless you guys really want me to because it is a bit graphic, but <laughs> they're able to pull everything through, uh, close you up, and then I woke up about a half hour later in horrible pain, a lot, a lot of pain. Um, it sounds like the recovery from this is similar to women who have a C-section. Um, so I was kind of talking to like women I know in my life who have had C-sections and it sounds like it's fairly similar. Um, the first day, I'm trying to figure out what I want to do here. I'll do the top here. Um, so the first day, like the actual day of the surgery, when I woke up, I first woke up. So there's like two stages of recovery. The first one, you wake up like 30 minutes after the surgery and your family is allowed to see you right after you wake up, but they're not allowed to stay back with you. They pretty much like come say hi. I remember talking to them say hi, and then they have them go back out into a waiting area until they get your pain under control. And I remember being told this, but I remember like not thinking I was going to be in a lot of pain. I don't know why that is. I've never had surgery before. This is my first surgery. So I think I was a little bit naive about what to expect. I remember talking to them and being in pain but I think they brought them back like right after I woke up. So it was, it was a lot happening. They say hi, they leave. And then the pain started to set in. And I was in that first stage of recovery for almost like two hours, actually. My husband and my mom were a little bit worried. They didn't get any communication about what was going on. But apparently my blood pressure was low, and so they were not able to give me pain medication, enough pain medication to get my pain under control for a little bit. But with time, they were able to do that. And eventually I moved to the second stage of recovery, which is where your family does come back. And then it's pretty much just like working on the discharge paperwork and getting you out of there, going over discharge instructions. 
there's a lot of information I could talk about with all of this. So if you guys want me to do a more in-depth video, that is not what this channel is about. But if you want me to do a video on my experience, I can definitely talk about it. Um, so the first day when my husband finally got me home, my mother-in-law came over and brought us a bunch of food. She is an amazing cook, so she made us a ton of food, uh, which we are still working through, and said hi. Father-in-law was there, too. And then I was pretty much just trying to manage my pain and get comfortable that first night, which did not happen. I did not sleep the first night. Uh, that was probably the roughest was that first night. And then the next day I was in a lot of pain as well. Um, but it felt a little bit more manageable. I did have a pain meds, like a, a controlled substance prescription, and then also just like a high dose of Tylenol and ibuprofen that I was supposed to switch between every three hours. So I was taking all the meds day two. That was pretty rough. It was just like very uncomfortable. It wasn't necessarily pain in the traditional way you think of it. It was more like I just could not get comfortable. Um, so that first day, second day, pretty rough. The third day, I woke up and obviously I didn't take I did sleep the second night slept like eight or nine hours, which is the first time I've done that in a while because this pain was happening before the surgery too. And I felt great the third day, woke up and I was in no pain. And I felt very, very confused about that because it seemed so like abrupt. So that third day is really when things started to shift. Um, what I've noticed since then, because I'm on day seven right now, is the pain has been very minimal since then, except at night, usually around like six or 7 p.m. It starts to get a little bit more uncomfortable. And it's really not pain. It's just uncomfortable. And usually around that time, I'll take the high dose of ibuprofen now because that at least reduces inflammation and then I'm usually able to fall asleep now and I'm waking up with very minimal pain. I would say the most uncomfortable part right now is the incisions are healing. So it's getting to that stage where it's kind of like itchy. Um, and then I'm not able to walk for long periods of time yet. So I'm allowed to be walking, but my restrictions are that I'm not allowed to do any like heavy exercise, any like strenuous physical activity, and I'm not allowed to lift anything, pull anything, push anything over 10 pounds. So there's a lot of stuff that I'm not allowed to do around the house right now. Um, let's just get this on here first. So probably that's the most uncomfortable thing is just that like my endurance is really not back yet, but I'm feeling a lot better. Like starting day three is when I started to feel better than I did before surgery. And even with that uncomfortable pain from the incisions, um, not being able to like do super strenuous stuff yet, I still feel better and it's less uncomfortable than it was before. So that's pretty fascinating to me. I had read a lot of other people's experiences, watched a lot of YouTube videos about other women who had ended up having to have the same surgery that I did. And a lot of people said this, but I wasn't really convinced. Like I was very nervous leading up to the surgery and with everything being rushed, and kind of like you have, like, this is something you need to do given the risk that we found. It was probably good that it was so rushed because 
I don't know if I would have been able to follow through with it had it not been like that. I think I would have chickened out from everything that I was reading and watching online because it's not like the surgery itself and the recovery are not easy. Like it is a pretty intense surgery, even when it's minimally invasive. So I'm, I'm glad in a sense that it was rushed and happened the way that it did, because I don't know that I would have been able to actually show up for the surgery if it wasn't the circumstances that it was. And the really interesting thing, so I did have like a potential cancer risk with some of the stuff that they found on the ultrasound, which is why it was so rushed. And we did get the pathology results back. And luckily, nothing was cancerous. Everything was benign. But they were able to basically figure out what was causing all of my issues. And because I had never technically had surgery, we suspected that these things were issues, but all of it was confirmed through the pathology. So they found quite a bit of endometriosis in my entire pelvic area, adenomyosis inside my uterus, which is basically endometriosis, but that's what they call it when it's inside of your uterus. Um, it causes your uterus to grow and become thicker beyond what it's supposed to be. Um, and then they also found scar tissue, which is basically endometriosis from what I understand, fusing some of my organs together all in my lower pelvic region. So that is why I was in as much pain as I was in. I also did have a cyst removed, but that ended up being not as concerning as we thought. Everything was benign with that. Um, but that gave me a huge sense of relief to know that I wasn't crazy, that there was actually something causing all of the issues that I was dealing with for all those years. It had really impacted my quality of life. And I don't think I, I think I'm still processing this on like day seven. I don't think I realized how much it was affecting me until day three after surgery. Like once I started to feel better, it was like, oh, you were actually feeling that bad for that long. Like, I don't even know how to estimate for you guys. I think I ha started having to have ultrasounds when I was 23 or 24. So it's been over 10 years now that I've been having to do this. Um, so there's a lot of a lot of relief with that, like knowing what the cause was, knowing that I'm already feeling better and there's a potential that my quality of life is going to be a lot different now. That's probably the thing I am most excited about now, but I would say there's definitely like emotions that come with it too. So because I kept my ovaries, I will not go into menopause, but for people who have this surgery and have to have their ovaries removed, so a radical hysterectomy, they often call that surgical menopause, where they will pretty much immediately go into menopause after the surgery. But because I kept my ovaries, that is not the case. However, I will experience some hormonal changes and a little bit of shift from that just because I no longer have a uterus or fallopian tubes. Um, and that is probably what I'm currently trying to figure out. I have definitely noticed some shifts. And I don't know that this would necessarily be hormonal, but I think one of them is now that I'm not in so much pain, I am feeling way less irritable, which is a little crazy. Um, it, it makes sense, right? Like if you're in pain, you're probably going to be irritable and uncomfortable. And I'm not 
not in pain right now. Like there is a little bit of uncomfortableness, is that a word? Um, obviously from like the post-op uh, experience, just recovering, healing, but it's way less than what I was dealing with before. And I can tell that I am feeling much less irritable because of that. But I do think even though we did not want to have kids, there is a weird like finality with this. And technically we could uh, have a surrogate. I have ovaries, so we could always do egg retrieval and have a surrogate if we decided we really wanted to have kids. That's a very expensive process, but that is an option we have. But I think that finality of knowing, like, I myself will not ever carry a child is kind of complex to process. I have therapy tomorrow, so I'll, <laughs> I'll do some processing there. Um, but that is, that's a part that they don't really, like, prepare you for. Um, they definitely talk to you about it. Like, they make sure that you understand how final the surgery is and what that means. But the emotional side of that, I mean, they can't prepare you for that. That's something you have to process on your own. And... I don't know that that affects my husband as much. Like, he definitely, we have been talking about it, but because it's not his body, I don't think he can understand that part fully. But that part's a little weird. I am still thinking about it, still processing what that means. And from what I understand, I've kind of been, like, watching other videos from other people who have gone through this. And it's really kind of difficult to explain because unless you've gone through it, you're not really going to understand that. And obviously, like, pregnancy loss, things like this, a lot of people do not talk about it. I personally, I have known a lot of people that have struggled with pregnancy loss and yet people don't talk about it still. It's like this thing in the U.S. I'm assuming probably other places too, but people don't seem to recognize that as a loss like they do uh, a full grown person, I guess you could say. But it seems similar to that, that like, unless you've gone through it and you know what kind of feelings that brings up, it's kind of hard to explain it to other people. So obviously I'm still trying to find the words for that, but that's definitely something I'll probably be processing for a while. And I would get... I guess one of the good things about the like recovery period is they do want you to take things very easy for like four to six weeks. I'm only taking two full weeks off from work because I work from home and I sit at this desk in a chair. So it's not like a physically demanding job. But having these two weeks off, I think is making a big difference. It's giving me time to process things before I have to go back. And then knowing that I do have to take things easy still for four to six weeks, even beyond that. I mean, it's, you can't not process what's happening. Like it, you are going to eventually think about it, which I think is good. It kind of like forces that to be something you have to do. So, I mean, I don't know that there's much else for me to talk about with that. Uh, let's see. Do I want to do this edge up here? Do a little bit more here. Um, there's probably not much more for me to talk about with that. 
uh, I am only seven days post-op, so there's obviously going to be probably a lot of changes I'm going to experience over the next couple of weeks. So I would be more than willing to provide an update on that. I am definitely an open book when it comes to this stuff. I know some people might find that weird, but as a therapist, I talk about serious stuff all the time. So it is kind of normal to me to just talk about things. And I also know that talking about things helps other people feel less alone because I know I am not the only person who's had to have this surgery. Apparently it is the second most common surgery to be performed in the U.S. So many, many people have had this surgery. Many people have gone through this and I am sure I'm not the only one trying to figure out how to process what all of it means. All right, so let's do a little after shot here. I don't know if this is going to look any different right now because this is the first coat that I have put on this. So let's put it in the exact same position. I think it looks a little bit more hydrated. But this is the first coat of, again, it's called Leather CPR. This is the one that I use the most. This is the other one that I've had, which you can see I've barely, oh, there's dust on there. I've barely used this. I just haven't gotten in the habit of reaching for this. So if you do use this, let me know if this is one of your favorites and maybe I need to consider using this one more. I also have the Coach Leather Moisturizer. This one I used to use a lot. I don't use it as much anymore. And then I also have Saddle Soap, which is what you use to clean bags. I have a round brush, so you would dip this in here, a little bit of water, and really scrub it down. I don't think this needs that. It is pretty clean, but this I would use if I had like a, a bag that needed a lot more work done on it. Um, oh, and I apologize for my the bruising on my hands from the surgery. That's just going to have to heal with everything else. Okay, guys, I think that is going to be it. Um, I didn't add anything. I think I did like a very light, uh, very light amount on the hang tag here, but I think this is looking pretty good for now. I have been switching between this bag and the Tabby 33 Guys, I think that Tabby 33 has broke me. I am a big bag girl now. That bag is amazing. I cannot get over it. So that might be the bag of the summer, but this one I also plan to use a lot. This is gonna be so nice for being hands-free. But I will probably do a couple other coats of this over time. After a day, I will take this and kind of buff it out a little bit. And then I'll go back and add another coat of this. And then we'll see how it's looking. I'll give you guys an update on this. I feel like it looks pretty good already, but I just want to get, you know, some hydration in there, clean up the leather a little bit, condition it, and then continue using it because I love this bag already. Uh, if I did not point this out, it does have nickel hardware, which I think is very cool looking on a black bag. I believe this is nickel. That's what I've heard it referred to as. You have nickel on here too. But let me know what you guys think of this bag. I rambled a lot about this whole experience with having a hysterectomy. So let me know if you guys have any words of wisdom there. Have you been through this yourself? Do you have any kind of like tips for me? during this recovery period. All right, YouTube, that's it. I'll see you next time. Bye.